switch things up a little bit, uh, I'd like to talk about someone that uh, I know pretty well, actually. He's a uh, coordinator for conservatives concerned about the death penalty. Now, I think about the death penalty, I'm in favor of the death penalty. But uh, when I started talking to Mark Hyden about it, I started looking at the website of conservatives concerned about the death penalty. I was a little shocked. How many conservatives and pretty household name type conservatives are against the death penalty? Uh, not, you know, we generally think maybe Catholics and Christians and the like, but a lot of social conservatives. And, and uh, I saw statements by Pat Robertson and S.J. Sekulow, uh, I think Greg Lozell. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. But let me tell you about Mark. He's, uh, he's with conservatives concerned about the death penalty. He's never political and social conservative questioning the alignment of uh, capital punishment, conservative principles and values. He was first he used to work for the NRA. Uh, he was a manager for a uh, national congressional race in North Carolina. Served as a public uh, affairs liaison with GMA in Georgia. And, uh, He's also an aide to the Senate Pro Tem here in Georgia's run. And most importantly, I think, uh, probably his claim to fame is that he is my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the ladies and gentlemen, Mark Hyde. Ron Paul, 
recently endorsed conservatives concerned about the death penalty, and I tell you, we were thrilled to have his support. I felt very fortunate. Uh, but he just simply stated capital punishment was completely inconsistent with traditional conservatives. Now, each one of these political and thought leaders, they all had their own personal journey that led them to believe that the death penalty was, let's say, problematic for a variety of reasons. But today, I'd like to talk a little bit about my own personal journey. As a pro-life advocate, I had a really hard time justifying the death penalty once I found out that over 140 individuals had wrongly convicted and sentenced to death. And many others have actually been executed for serious doubt regarding the veracity of their verdict. Many of these people, uh, I actually have the privilege of calling friends because I've been able to work closely with them, like, like Anthony Graves. He spent 12 years on death row and another six years in prison for allegedly murdering a family of six. The prosecution in his case fought tooth and nail to withhold the testimony from the real low killer being introduced as evidence until he was finally exonerated in 2010. He came so close where he was actually strapped into the gurney and prepared to receive the death penalty drug, knowing that he was innocent. Uh, and he's one of the, the good stories, I or not good, but better. Carlos de Luna is, was not so lucky. He was convicted and executed for allegedly murdering a gas station at 10 in 1983. Uh, all the evidence was circumstantial, and there was one person, one eyewitness that they relied on, who said he was 50% sure that DeLuna was the perpetrator. Of course, the criminal justice system is supposed to be more than 50% sure before convicting someone, let, let alone executing them. But mistaken eyewitness testimony is actually the source of many of our wrongful convictions, and after he was executed, uh, a lot more evidence actually came out to suggest that he was actually not the killer. But stories like these happen far too often, but many like to tell me that well, we live in an age of technology, forensic science, and DNA. Well, today's reality resembles nothing, like the CSI television shows that we see on TV. DNA is available in up to 10% of all criminal cases, and we saw recently that that forensic science, or so-called forensic science, is often flawed. The FBI and the Department of Justice are working in tandem right now to investigate over 2,000 cases and 27 capital cases where they're using unreliable forensic testimony regarding hair analysis. So the government found that it was completely unreliable, not much like other forensic information, uh, biopark analysis, and they led to some seriously disastrous consequences. And here's my case in point. Claude Jones. He was executed in 2000 for allegedly shooting a man in a liquor store in Texas. The key evidence that was central to Claude Jones' conviction was based on a hair fragment that was found at the scene of the crime. Now, forensic experts at the time claimed they were sure, they were positive, this was Claude Jones' hair. They said science even backed up their claims. Well, after he was executed, DNA evidence revealed that that was not his hair after all. Stories like his and stories like I'm getting ready to tell everybody should offend those of us who are dedicated to protecting the potential against of life and promoting physical sanity in government. Now, everybody here knows political responsibility, restraint, prudence, that, that's a simple concept in conservative. But you know what? Study after study has shown that the death penalty is far more expensive than life without parole, and it's even led to tax increases. Why is it more expensive? It's more expensive because the initial trial is many times longer than comparable trials with more experts, more motions, and a mountain of legal fees. If there's an additional trial that's unique to capital cases, it exists just to see if the offender can receive the death sentence. Then there's the appeals process. This process is so long, it's an automatic process, it's decades long, and it's the longest in the criminal justice system. It's so long that many offenders actually die of a while they wrote on the death penalty. You need to consider housing these guys. Because they're housed on death row, which is far more expensive than housing in a maximum security prison uh, in general population. So to give you an idea, uh, next slide. Just to give you an idea of the length, the cost, and the waste of these cases, my friend Stacy Rector in Tennessee, she tried to get the transcript from a capital case. So it was like a pretty basic request. She couldn't afford it. 
Not because she lives in poverty, but because the transcript was 115,000 pages long. You stack that up, you bound that as a book, that book can be over 38 feet thick. It's more than six times as tall as I am. Uh, that's, that makes the Bible look like a casual afternoon read. But you know what? Somebody has to pay for these expensive and lengthy processes. And spoiler alert, it's you and I. We're the ones that get stuck with this bill. In capital cases, have a long track record for pushing county budgets to the brink of bankruptcy and leading to tax increases. Jasper County Taxes, for instance, they had to raise their taxes by 7% to cover the cost of one death penalty trial. For any county in Texas, they had to raise their taxes too because of the cost of two death penalty trials. In Jefferson County, Florida, they were on a trajectory for bankruptcy due to the cost incurred from one trial. And they slashed their budget severely just to stay up on flow. So, I'm often asked exactly how expensive is the death penalty? And I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. It's really hard to say because there's no budget out there with a line item that says death penalty. It just doesn't work that way. Each state pays for a death penalty. The costs are carried on local, state, and federal levels. But a few studies have been done that can give us a rough idea of what kind of inefficiency, what kind of waste and kind of, uh, physical abuse that we're dealing with. Probably the most egregious of all case studies is what's going on in California right now. They spent $4 billion on the death penalty program and executed 13 people. $4 billion for 13 executions is a far cry from the uh, fiscal conservatism and efficiency in government Demand. And a study in Maryland, we go, there you go. A study in Maryland found it cost $3 million just to reach a death sentence. That doesn't include the other costs associated with death penalty, like the appeals process, the housing. It's $1.9 million more than a non death penalty case. And a study in Texas found it cost $2.3 million just to reach a death sentence. And you know what? That's three times the cost of imprisoning an inmate for four years in a maximum security prison. This should be pretty offensive to conservatives. It should be even more offensive to the elected officials who are supposed to act as stewards of the taxpayers' hard-earned money because conservatives, like you and I, know better than anyone that in an age of annual deficits and ballooning public debt, there are no sacred cows, especially when it comes to government programs that are wasteful, inefficient, and ineffective, like the death penalty. Now, even going back to our forefathers, like Benjamin Franklin, who actually opposed the death penalty, limited government has been a central tenet of Americanism and conservatism. Let's be honest with each other here. At least in my opinion, giving the government the power to kill U.S. citizens is not a form of limited government. Our government should be limited. It's the state that decides whether to seek a death sentence, and it's the state that has implemented a framework that favors the will of the government in capital cases. You don't want the death penalty to, uh, to be administered with the same advocacy, with the same efficiency as the box of Obamacare care will have. Life's too precious for that. Bottom line here is, if you don't trust the government to carry out mundane actions, like properly delivering a piece of mail, or efficiently running the DMV, why would you trust them to administer this program? There's, there's no greater power than the power to take a life. Our government currently reserves that authority. But we as conservatives, we know better. We know better than to trust them with this kind of power because we've seen countless examples of the government abusing its power. The, the human element in government and the human element in the death penalty makes us susceptible to abuse and misuse. And when it comes to life, that's unacceptable. Now, personally, my final struggle with the death penalty was deterrence. I thought, even with all the death penalty's failures, at least to save lives by deterring future crime. Once again, I was wrong. Several studies have actually shown that death penalty does not deter crime. In fact, the region that uses it the most has the highest murder rates. And if it did deter murder, then what in Texas, the state, they use it the most year after year after year. Finally, by now, the lowest murder rates. And they don't. In fact, they're not even remotely close. But today we're finding that even murder victims' family members are speaking out against the death penalty. And I've had the privilege of working closely with many of them, and not all of them oppose capital punishment outright. But almost every single one of them says the current system of capital punishment fails them. It fails them because it promises them a death sentence. 
The way the system is structured, that promise isn't always kept. You re-traumatize them through a decades-long process of trials and appeals, and in the end, it turns the offender of the household name. Yeah. The victim. The victim more than likely is forgotten. But not all murderers and family members are subjected to this program because not all murderers receive a death sentence. So who gets a death sentence? Is it the most heinous of murderers? The answer is no. The current system of capital punishment is executed. People like Carlos Deluna, who may have been innocent, while offenders like Jeffrey Dahmer or Charles Manson are not executed. I don't care if you support the death penalty or you don't. I think we all agree something's not right with that. Essentially, what we have is a lottery of geography. You can be, you can have two identical crimes in two adjacent counties and receive two different sentences. One of life without parole and one of death. Because most counties don't use the death penalty. In fact, most counties can't afford it. In fact, it's only 2% of all U.S. counties that account for the majority of all death sentences in the United States. This arbitrary use of capital punishment, it, it offers no real reason why some people are executed and others are not. But today, today six states in six years, when we get to the next slide, is, uh, have repealed the death penalty. Uh, because 18 states in total have abolished it. Because they found that for years of trying to make this program work properly through numerous legislative, judicial, and policy changes. But it was a revenue program. They couldn't fix it. So with that being known, we go to the next slide. It shouldn't surprise anyone that the outcome is important for capital punishment is that it's the lowest point in 40 years. And a poll in North Carolina found that 68% of North Carolinians support repealing and replacing the death penalty with a system of life without parole while the offender works. He works to pay restitution to the victim's families. And the majority of those who were polled were self-described conservatives. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, in closing, and before I, I field a couple of questions, I'd, I'd like to paraphrase a man by the name of Ron Briggs and go ahead and apologize to the attorneys or aspiring attorneys in the room. Ron Briggs is an elected Republican official in California. And he and his father worked nearly single handedly to reinstate and expand the use of Catholic punishment in the 1970s. And he now opposes it. He said, Close your eyes and imagine a government program that costs billions of dollars gives all that money to attorneys and criminals, risks innocent lives, and many times fails at central goals. What would you do with that program? The answer is you'd repeal it. I, like all conservatives, like, like all of you out there, I want to hold offenders accountable without being soft on them because there has to be personal responsibility for actions and justice must be implemented for, for victims and for the order of society. But, it's important that we can still implement strict justice, but we have to be smart on crime too. We can't continue to support the death penalty when it's run so poorly. It risks innocent life. It hemorrhages taxpayer dollars when cheaper alternatives exist. And it gives the government power it neither deserves or should be trusted with. But whether you support the death penalty in theory or biblically, I think all of us can agree our government doesn't run this program well or up to theoretical, or up to biblical standards. It never has, and it never will, because there's no such thing as a perfect government program. And a program designed to kill guilty U.S. citizens has to be perfect, because there's zero margin for error when you're dealing with life. When the government kills an innocent person, it becomes no better than the offenders that it's trying to execute. And with that, if we want to ask a couple of questions, I'd be happy to take it. Do you pose the death sentence even in the case of uh, treason during a time of war and I'm talking about based on a trial, not based on an arbitrary drone strike? Uh, good question. Um, that's more of a federal level. We deal with it on a state-by-state -state legislative basis. And I understand that sometimes you have cases that are very obvious that they may be guilty, but the system is imperfect. So having that system in place where we can put people to death puts innocent lives at risk. So I pose the death penalty out. Uh, yes, uh, for someone that supported the death penalty for a long time, like myself, you present a very, very good, solid case to reconsider. But lately, as some people are in the process of transforming America, they want to now offer voting rights to felons. So where do we 
stop the transformation. You know, some of it might be suitable for what we need to do. And then we have felons sitting in prison, which, you know, let's give their road uh, right back to vote. How do we balance this stuff? That's a much broader criminal justice question. And, you know, I have a very narrow scope when it comes to just the death penalty and the criminal justice system. So that would be a little bit outside of, outside of my comfort zone with that. So I apologize. I, I can't add anything to that. Anyone else? For the states that don't have a death penalty and have repealed it, what is the crime rate in those states? I can't give you the exact crime rate, but I can tell you I've been in Connecticut and Illinois, they very recently repealed the death penalty and their murder rates went down. Well, I noticed that Illinois, which is my home state, is listed as one that repealed the death penalty, and they have some of the highest crime rates in, in Illinois. Well, don't mistake Chicago with the rest of the state. <laughs> well, I don't happen to be where I'm from. Um, but the other, the other side of that, uh, isn't that going to be, if you repeal the death penalty and you put these people in jail for life with no chance of parole, doesn't that increase the population in the prisons and the cost to the taxpayers? No, actually you'd be saving money because the process that's in place People on death row is far more expensive than housing people for the rest of their lives. And also remember that many of these people are, that are on death row, depending on the state, they're going to be there the rest of their lives. So they're actually in a more expensive part of the prison and they're you know, exhausting the longest appeals process that's out there. So it would be much cheaper to go to life without parole. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Would you, uh, if you want to do away with the death penalty, would you support very strongly strengthening the Second Amendment? <laughs> I work for the NRA before this, so uh, I'm all for the second amendment, absolutely. I was just going to ask you, because the studies that have been done actually in Georgia of the possibility of uh, feeling it or refueling it? You know, I haven't seen any studies specific to Georgia right now. There's a hotbed of stuff going on in Georgia. We recently passed a bill to make that money drug when we get it a state secret, so that's being litigated right now. And for some of the sports transparency in government to keep government honest, uh, I have a little bit of a problem with that. Uh, well, you're, you're quoting the murder rates being down in those states, but the murder rates across the country are down over the last several years, so I don't think we can use that as a statistic to go by. However, I'm sorry, I can't agree with you when, when I see the the victims, families, and when I, I think these people need a, a closure. And, and the way to get there, I think you're correct. The program is way too expensive, way too lengthy. They should not have this with the appeals process available to them. They should be a one state appeal, one federal appeal. If that fails, then they should be put to death immediately. Sure, let me uh, answer both of those. Uh, first thing, there is a myth of closure. You have a family member murdered. There's no such thing as closure. Um, and the appeals process, if you want to limit that, it's virtually guaranteeing that some people will die because we've seen people that have been through over 30 years of appeals before they were actually exonerated and released. So. Well, Jason, thank you so much, and uh, I'll hand it back over to you.